So we've been having some fun solving quadratics through various methods, algebraic methods mostly, but you know, it's the year 2017 right now and you have a lot of technology out there that you're going to be using. So if the time is appropriate, it's okay to use your graphing calculator to find solutions when it's appropriate. Sometimes I'm going to make you show me certain methods and you have to illustrate those methods, but um, if, if it doesn't say anything, then all methods are fair game, right? <coughs> One moment. So when we're taking our notes here, you want to make sure you follow through with me on your graphing calculator. I'm also going to ask you to sketch your viewing window of your calculator off to the side. And if we did this on a test, I would expect the same thing from you. Okay. So we're going to want to solve this equation, which if we tried to solve this algebraically, it is not in any sort of form. <laughs> so we would probably move everything to one side. We'd decide what method to use. More than likely, we'd I guess we'd probably, I don't know, it actually does factor, um, but we wouldn't know that till we did a lot of work. So let's talk about what we could use our calculator for. So an equation, when you're trying to solve it, one side of the equation can be one function. So, whoops, you can type this into y1, and the other side of the equation doesn't even have to look pretty. You can type it into y2. So essentially we're graphing a system of equations and where they cross, where they intersect, is going to be your possible solutions. And you might have more than one, so we have to be able to maneuver the window a little bit, right? So going to our calculator, it doesn't matter which, oops, old problem, get rid of it. <laughs> um, doesn't matter which is in y1 and which is in y2, but if you're following with me, I'm going to put x minus 2 in y1. And then negative 1 half x squared in y2. Oy, you guys are probably already done typing this because you're way faster at this. Plus two. And my window is all messed up from my last problem, so I'm going to hit Zoom 6. It's one of my pre-programmed windows. It's that nice negative 10 to 10 window. I always like to start there. And it looks like I can see both my solutions. I knew the negative 1 half x squared plus 2 was an upside down parabola, shifted up 2. And x minus 2 was a line with a y-intercept at 2. Negative 2. Um, no. Yeah, negative two. So the two intersection points, I need to find them. And remember, we're trying to solve for x. So when you find these ordered pairs, all I'm looking for is the x value of them. So using our calc menu, using intersect, which I think I already knew the answers from the graph, but you know, it's good to confirm. First curve, enter. Second curve, enter. If we had like six different functions graphed, you'd want to hop between them, right? But we only have the two. And then when it says guess, it's going to go to whichever one it's closest to. So after I hit enter, it's going to find this one. Prove me wrong. No, it did. So x equals 2. And we're going to do all those steps again. So intersect. And then this time, before I hit enter the third time, I'm going to have to scroll along my curve a little bit. Until I'm closer to the other one. x equals negative 4. So my two solutions are negative 4 and 2. So over here, you're going to want to sketch, right? Oh, boy. Ugh. All right, so we had an upside down parabola, kind of like that. Oh, man, it's pretty good for me. And then x minus 2 is like this. Oh, boy, not, not a line. Um, but the idea was you were finding these two intersection points. So this is what I would expect from you if you were utilizing the graphing method. We have graph by hand on coordinate plane. Well, yeah, totally. Um, but you know, why not use our calculator? So this next part is going to be similar. We're going to have two parabolas, though. So this first one, I'm going to enter into y1, and then this second one, we're going to enter into y2. So it is a little tedious on my emulator because the reaction time on it is a very slow. You guys are probably done already. If you are very well versed in graphing calculators, you can probably skip ahead in this lesson for a little while. Um, the back of this notes is probably the most exciting part because that's where the applications come in and that's what everyone wants fun, right? Application. All right, so we have a regular parabola that shifted down for and then an upside down parabola that was shifted up for. Obviously, I'm gonna have different intersection points, but wouldn't that be fun if they were the same? And they're not. Oops. I don't know. Oh. Not an eraser. Okay, so we're going to find these two intersection points. 
Um, guys, I'm pretty sure it's negative two and two, and I can actually cheat and confirm. If I just hit trace to pull up the cursor and then type negative two, if it pops out as a zero for the Y, um, I'm pretty sure that's what happened there, right? I mean, think about that algebraically, like negative two squared minus four is zero. And then what was the other one? Um, negative two squared is four, but then the negative in front of it plus four is also zero. So yeah. All right. So anyways, you could still do the intersect method like this. But you know, it's negative two. <laughs> and then you do the same thing for the other one. And it is also positive two. So my two solutions were x equals two and negative two. So over here, I would expect ugh, to see a much better sketch than what I'm about to do. <laughs> so the first one was a parabola looking like so. Oh, gosh. Awful. And then this guy was a parabola looking like, oh, like had such promise to begin with. Um, and the two intersection points is what I was finding. So the second method is the x-intercept method, but essentially it's the same thing. Everything you're going to. If it's already set up in a form where one side of the equation is zero, you don't have to do the intersect method. Although I have had kids in the past who decide they just love the intersecting method. So they will actually put this y equals zero into y2 and then just keep finding the intersection of those two. That still works because technically y equals zero is a function, right? But the other option is if it is in standard form ready to solve, you could type all of this function into y1. And then we're going to see where the function crosses the x, <laughs> the x axis. Oh, bully. Uh, I don't know. It looks something like this when we graph it, right? So we're going to have to find this x intercept and this x intercept. So if we want to do that on a calculator, we sure could. Um, got to clear out everything, though. Come on, man. Okay. So it doesn't matter which function you put it into, but. 7x squared plus 7x minus 15. Now, if this was factorable, I could have really cheated and found an algebraic set of solutions, but it turns out this is not factorable. It's going to have funky solutions. <clears throat> and don't be um, tricked by your calculator. Sometimes kids are looking here and they can give me like an estimated answer. Like they're really certain that this is negative 2. Turns out it's not negative 2. It's actually a little different than negative 2. So we're going to find this x-intercept and this x-intercept using the x-intercept method or the zero finder. So back to the calc menu. But this time instead of intersect, because I don't have a y2, I'm going to choose number 2, which says find the zeros. But remember, we did talk about how some kids always type a second function because they love the intersecting one. Okay, so depending on which one you want to find, it doesn't matter, but you need to drag your cursor to the left of, like, I'm going to find this one first. So you can just keep hitting left arrow until you pop up here, or you can make it hop by typing in something that you know is to the left of that. So, like, negative 3 is definitely to the left of that. Like, negative 3, and then, boop, there it goes. All right, and then to the right of it, I can tell that negative 1 is to the right of it. And then I can see, I like those domain boundaries. I can see the intercept right between them. So I hit enter one last time. And it's at negative 2.05. So, you know, it tricked me at first too. But that's one of the x-intercepts. Let's do that again for the next x-intercept. Got to pull up the command again. That's kind of annoying, but, you know, get over it. Um, something, I'm just going to go slightly to the left. I can tell that 0 is slightly to the left. So hit enter. Your calculator is doing calculus. That's what it's doing. So it needs a, a, an appropriate window to do its calculus on. And then enter one last time, 1.05. So they do have some symmetry to them. Sometimes you can see it. Sometimes it's not as obvious. All righty. Um, this one... If I really, really, really love that method, so using the x-intercepts or the zero finder, you can only do it when it's just one function and it's set equal to zero. So essentially, you have to have everything on one side of the equation. So what if I moved everything yonder? So I'd subtract x squared, so negative 83 x squared. I know, like, algebraically, ugh, but we're not going to use algebra. Um, we're going to be using a calculator, and he does not care what form you're in. When I add 9, what's that, plus 24? All right. 
No. <laughs> Minus 24. Minus 24. Oy. Okay, so I'm going to type that into my calculator. I get rid of the old one. Negative 83 x squared. Ugh. And then plus 98x. See if I can do it right. Minus 24. And then we're going to graph it. Oh boy, that's not great. Um, I can, okay, even with my like old lady eyes, I can see the two x intercepts, but I'm not real ecstatic about that window. So I'm going to go to my window and I'm going to adjust the x's so they're way tighter. So like zero to four. It's probably even too big, but that's okay. And, you know, kind of a guessing. So that's easier for me to see. So when I go to find the x-intercepts or the zero command, I choose zero. And then left bound of this guy, I can tell zero would be left of him. So good to go. Um, I'm not really sure. I think this is one. So like I'm thinking point 0.5 is to the right of him. I won't go too far. Yeah, good job, Bruzo. And then enter one more time. Point two three five. So we should jot that down. I love how I write it on the screen like it means anything to me. I'm not going to take that with me. All right, so we're going to go back and find the other zero. This time, going left and right of that zero. All right, so left of them. Technically, I'm already left of them, but like I'm a little far away. So I'm just going to type point five because I remember that was slightly to the left of it. Now to the right of it would be point, uh, not point one, one. <laughs> I like those domain lines. That really excites me. You guys don't know the struggle of us back in the day when we couldn't tell where our cursors were. Point eight three. All right. So there are two x-intercepts. Definitely would not have found them nicely algebraically. I would have had to use quadratic formula, uh, which would have been a real good time, I can tell. All right. <laughs> I didn't sketch that on my paper, but please do that. Now this one is an object that's being dropped from a height of 96 feet. They gave you the function, so we'll go ahead and type that in. We're going to use x's instead of t's. Remember that negative 16 is um, the acceleration due to gravity in feet per second squared on Earth. So you're going to keep seeing that if it's measured in feet per second squared, or feet per second, um, plus 96. Now, because we're dropping the object, this is like just a two-term quadratic equation. That middle term is nothing because that middle term represents velocity at which, some, at which something is launched or thrown or kicked. So since we're just like dropping it, we're not launching it in any way. So there's no middle term. That's why you're seeing that. Now, <laughs> the old window, <laughs> not going to work. <laughs> so what's nice about me just hitting graph, though, is I can see that the object hits the ground like after two seconds, between two and three seconds. So... When I go to set up my window, I'm going to leave it at 0 to 4 for x's, but i got to go way bigger in the y's. Um, remember, we dropped the object from, like, what, 96 feet up in the air. So let's let's make the top bound, like, 100. you got to be able to see it. <clears throat> Lovely. <laughs> so that's what it looks like when you drop an object and you're modeling the height versus time. Um, write down the window we used, like, 0. To, we did 0 to 4, but whatever. Uh, you just got to make sure it's appropriate. Like, I get kids sometimes are like, oh, I did 0 to 100, and it was fine because I could totally see it. Well, okay, yes, you can see it, but that's not really an appropriate window. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure it's going to take less than 100 seconds for something to drop off of a 100-foot building. Like, that's a long time. <laughs> um, so they want to know what time it hit the ground. We're going to need to find the x-intercept or the 0 right there because the height is 0. Hey, you know what? For fun. Let's go to y2, and let's just put y equals 0 there, so you can see what it looks like when you do the intersect method instead of the intercept method. Confusing. All right, so this time, since I have two functions, I would choose the intersect, and then it graphs both of them, and then enter, enter, enter. So 2.4 seconds. So I have some kids who just love using the fifth option, the intersect, and every single time they type y equals 0 into y2. That's fine. I, I really don't care. I think I did that when I was in high school, and uh, yes, I had a less cool calculator than you do, but you know, it works. So that was a little review of using our graphing calculator um, to find solutions. We're going to 
kind of be lazy smart. So if it's appropriate, do it. If it's not, don't. The next few questions, we're still going to want to use our graphing calculator, but we got to set them up because they're going to be um, a toy problem. <laughs> okay, so we're going to see this problem a lot. Get used to it. We have, we're going to make a box, and it's going to have a square base, so same dimensions on both sides. And we're going to have to make it out of a piece of cardboard. That sounds awful. <laughs> so you have a big square piece of cardboard, and you're going to cut corners out of it. And then you're going to fold the cardboard up into a box. So um, let me, let's see. Since I can't draw, how about we draw this? Thanks. <laughs> and then, so we're going to cut little corners. Whoops. They got to be the same size. Gosh. If you think I draw bad, wait till you see how I cut. Worse. My kids, when they come home with like art projects and stuff, uh oh. And they're going to be the same size. So I don't know what they are right now, but I know they're like X by X. Because otherwise, you're going to have a wonky box, which is like everything I ever make. Wonky. All right. So it does say, oh, read. Gosh. You know, most mathematical errors on story problems. Are not mathematical errors they are reading errors um we're going to cut six inches out of the corner so each of these are six totally did that on on purpose so i could illustrate what sort of errors you people will do no, I didn't. um the box has to have a volume of 1000 cubic inches how big is the piece of cardboard now there's a couple of different ways we could set this up you could call the distance of like the actual box dimensions x like this or you could call the whole piece of the cardboard X, and I don't really care. So for me, personally, I think it's easier if you just call from here to here X, which means here to here is also X, and here to here is also X, and here to here is also X. Oh gosh, ugly. Um, which means that at the end of the problem, when they wanna know how big the cardboard should be, it's X plus six plus six, or in other words, it's X plus 12. So that's how I set it up, but like my colleague who teaches this, she teaches it where um, the whole side is X, and then after she cuts off the little six pieces, she calls this part from here to here X minus 12. So her box is X minus 12 by X minus 12, and then the height of it is still X. So we're going to end up with the same answer. I don't care which one you do. So the volume of a box is length times width times height. So for our box, I know the volume is 1,000. The length for me is x times x, and the height is 6, the way I set it up. Okay, So x times x times 6. In other words, it's 6x squared. whoop do you do right? Now, because of the way I set it up, this is actually super easy to solve algebraically. Just divide by 6 and then square root. We wouldn't use the negative answer. Um, so it is going to be a decimal though, and it comes out to like 12.9 ish the way I set it up. But remember, they don't want to know how big the box is. They want to know how big the original piece of cardboard was. So 12.9 plus 12 is 24.9 by, oops, I should label, huh? Inches by 24.9 inches. Okay. So my colleague who set it up differently, she set up 1,000 equals x minus 12 times x minus 12 times 6. Uh, she ended up with the same x value. Um, well, her algebra comes out to, <clears throat> when she solved this on the calculator, which she had to use the calculator the way it's set up, she got 24.9 right away off the bat. And then she went back to her picture and realized, like, oh, I already found the whole dimension of the box. So she didn't have that extra step of going back and adding in the 12.9. So it really doesn't matter, guys. Whatever makes you happy. All right, the next one is super duper duper difficult. So hang with me, okay? Like I had to stop and think about this one for a while when I was keeping it up. <clears throat> okay. A farmer wishes to enclose three pens shown like so. And the farmer has 700 feet of fencing. So that's like, I, I would normally say it's perimeter, but it's more than perimeter. It's like perimeter plus these two little pieces in the middle. So what dimensions will maximize the area? So at some point, we need to come up with an expression for area, which is an area just length times width for this picture. Um, this is going to get exciting. <laughs> okay. So 
I don't know how long this whole area, this shape will be, but let's call it Y. And then I don't know how like wide it'll be from here to here, but let's call it X. And remember, we're using fence everywhere I'm drawing, right? So if this, again, if we don't like a wonky pen, all of these are the same, X and X and X. And if this length right here is Y, so is this length right here. So, oops, one more X. There we go. So if I think about how much fencing I just used, I used two X, two Ys, and four Xs. And I think a while ago they told me that um, I have 700 feet of fencing, right? So, like, is that an appropriate answer? I think I think so. Okay, so the other thing that I know, or at least that I want to use, is the area formula. So if we're using this shape and these dimensions, the area of this dude is going to be x times y, whatever they happen to be. Now, I know this is kind of difficult to look at right now, but what we are looking at is a system of equations. So, what you could do is instead of saying this is x times y, if you were to solve for either x or y up in this top equation, we could substitute that expression into here. So I just feel like solving for this y, so kind of off to the side here, I'm going to write down what happens when you solve for y. Isolate y. We'll subtract 400. Wow. Subtract 4x <laughs> and then divide by 2. And I'm not even going to clean this up because I'm about to use my calculator, so I don't care what this looks like. So y could also be written as 700 minus 4x. So right here, instead of x times y, what if we called it x times 700 minus 4x over 2? Because that's essentially the same thing. I remember the whole point of this was to use my graphing calculator and then figure out where the max is. Guys, look at what we have here. We have a variable, a single variable equation. It is ugly. And I am not solving this algebraically, which means I don't care if it's ugly. So my calculator can handle it. So get out of that zero thing. All right. I already forgot what it was. It was x, x, parenthesis, 700. <laughs> uh, I kind of wish I would have simplified this now that I think about it. Can I just quickly divide those guys by the two? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So I'm going to call it 350 minus 2x. Otherwise, I would have had to use another set of parentheses and not really feeling it. Okay. So there's my expression for area. I'm going to hit graph just from the old window sometimes. Ooh. I was going to say, sometimes you luck out and it like works beautifully for your next problem, but this is not one of those cases. So we need to go up in our window. It needs to go way higher. So bigger than 100, apparently. Oh, you know what I bet the problem is? I don't think it has to go bigger than 100. I think our X just has to go bigger. Let's go like... Mm. Let's go 100. I already know the answer, so I'm kind of cheating. And we'll go like 200. And sometimes this is a guessing game. Like you'll fix one part of it and go, oh, not good enough. Oh man, I typed something wrong. Okay. Window. Zero, 100. Should be fine. Oh, I forgot. Okay, you know what I did? I thought Y was my Y for my problem. In this problem, Y is not measuring the Y of the, the fence. It's measuring the area of the fence. So I need to go way bigger. That's why I wasn't seeing anything. Way, 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 way bigger. Let's go like 2,000. Again, I'm cheating because I already know the answer. <sighs> oh. The area is like 15,000. Let's go 20,000. I need bifocals. Sorry, guys.
Okay. Ooh, I can't see the whole quadratic, at least like the, you know, when it comes back down, but I don't care. All I need to find is the maximum up there. So if we go to calc and we choose maximum, sorry, that took me a while to get the window, huh? Left bound, got it. Right bound, I'm going to go like do 100 because wasn't that the end of our window? Oh, too far. Come on, delay. Nailed it. Okay, so we got to be careful here. Don't pull on a bruzo and forget what their variables are representing. X is X from my picture. So that is how Y, like this way the picture had to be, 87.5. But this is the area of my pen, which they don't even want that. <laughs> so they want X and Y for the pen, right? So what we just found was X equals, I should have wrote this down, 87.5 feet. And then we got to go back. I would go right here and figure out why by plugging in 87.5. Now, it's not going to be 100% accurate because we got to round a little bit, right? But that's okay. So after I do a little calculation here, I figure out that that is 175 feet-ish. I think it comes out exact when you round like that. So the dimensions are 87.5 feet by 175 feet for this entire shaped pen. Ooh. Farmers, tough break. All right. <laughs> this next one's fun. So a salesperson finds their sales average of 40 cases per store when she visits 20 stores. But if she visits an additional store per week, her sales decrease by one case per store. So how many stores should she visit every week to kind of maximize how much she's selling? So there's a bit of a trade-off. Like she's going to go to more stores, so she'll get more cases sold, like as a whole but only to a certain point because her like efficiency is going to kind of go down. So let's kind of map this out. And I think we'll, we'll start to develop some algebra after we kind of map out what's happening. So if she visits um, 20 stores per week, she sells 40 cases per store. And if you multiply those together, that gives her 800 cases sold in total for the week. But if she visits 21 stores, she is going to decrease by one case. So she's only going to do 39 stores. So if I multiply that together, I get 819. So it's still going up. And you can continue like this chart forever until you figure it out where she's like dropping back down. But I think now would be a good moment to set up some algebra because that's what I'm going to ask you to do. So this column right here is just 20, but then plus, um, like a mystery amount of stores that she's going to add to 20, right? So how many additional stores is she going to visit? But this column here is 40, but then you take away one for each additional store that she visits. And then we multiply them together to figure out this column here. So algebraically, I could simplify what it looks like to multiply these together. But remember, guys, we're going to be using our calculator. So on our calculator, I'm just going to type this. Sounds good to me. Calculator does not care if things are simplified. That's why he's just so easy going like that, right? So leaving it in essentially is intercept form, but whatever. 20 minus, sorry, 20 plus X helps if you type it right. 40 minus X. Yeah, get off the tablet. I need a break. I'm tired. 4th of July. You'd hear the firecrackers outside. All right, now, probably the window is awful. Yeah, that's not a good window. Um, so let's fix our window here, guys. Apparently, you don't need to go up to uh, 20,000. Let's go like, um, I don't know, 1,000? I think your X's were okay, though. Let's see. Hey, that's nice. And I got to maximize, right? I want to make the most money I can. So find the max. Four. Left bound, zero. Yes. Right bound, let's go like, I don't know, 50. I don't know if that's far right enough. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then enter. What a nice calculator. All right, so the maximum point is 10, 900 when you don't worry about that rounding business. Oops, 
So when you think about what that means, X represented how many additional stores she should visit. So she should visit um, 10 additional stores, right? So the question is, how many stores should she visit? She was going to visit 20 regardless, but 10 additional. So this lady should be visiting 30 stores each week. And, you know, this is something you have to think about. I don't think as like an individual sales commission person, you would probably calculate this. But if you're running some sort of a manufacturing setting, like efficiency and productivity, like those all go hand in hand. And how much it costs to run the machines and how many people it costs to staff them. Um, they break down, you know, that wasn't a machine problem, but same idea. The person who does the math that figures all this out is the one who gets paid the most money. All right, a potter can sell 120 bowls per week for $4 per bowl, but um, if they're willing to lower the price by 50 cents, they're going to keep selling 20 extra bowls. But remember, if you lower the price too much, it doesn't matter if you're selling more bowls because you're not making as much money in the long run. So bowls sold, 120 is what they start out at. And it's four dollars per bowl, so money that they take in would be four eighty. But if they sell them for fifty cents less, so that'd be like three fifty. They're gonna sell twenty extra bowls, so one forty. So they're still gonna make more money. It's gonna come out to four ninety, and so on and so on. So I think now's a good moment to come up with some algebra. So you're going to start off with 120, and then for every additional um, price decrease, you're going to sell 20 more. So it's like 20x added to that. So here you're going to start off at $4, but you're going to take away 50 cents for each increase, well, decrease in price. So on my calc, this is going to go on my calculator. All right. <clears throat> Like I said, you guys are so fast at typing. You probably already had this done. 120 plus 20x. And then 4 minus 0.5x. Again, no need to simplify because your calculator can handle any form you give it. You just got to type it right. All right. So again, hey, you know what? It's not a great window. We should probably shrink it back, but all I need to do is find the max. So if you can already find it, then you rock. I'm going to go ahead and shrink this back, though, to like 20. That would be plenty, plenty many. All right. So finding the maximum. Finding the maximum. Using 4. Make sure you choose the right command. 0 is to the left. Eh, let's see. 6 is definitely to the right. And the max is at one price decrease, so the very first one we found. So the question is, how much should they sell the bowls for? Um, one price decrease of 350 per bowl, which means they're going to sell 140 bowls because that was 20 extra bowls. All right. Those are a little difficult to set up. Do the best you can. Um, getting it to the algebraic state is where you have to be.